Hey, nursing students, Miss Midoff here to talk to you about muscular skeletal system. We're going to be talking about various objectives, bone cancer, gout, osteomalacia, and Paget's disease. And we're going to be talking about all these different factors as it relates to these four disease processes. Then we're going to be talking about diagnostic procedures, serum alkaline phosphatase, serum calcium, serum urate, and talking about these different factors as it relates to these diagnostic procedures. Then we're going to be talking about these seven medications of the muscular skeletal system and the factors associated with those medications as well. Let's start with bone cancer, the objective one. Just as a review, there are some prefixes and things that will allow us to know what we're talking about based off of the prefix that is used. So osseo means bone, fib means fibrous tissue, oma means morbid growth or tumor, sarc means bone and soft tissue. Bone tumors are classified into two classes. You can have benign or malignant. And underneath each one here, you see an example of a name of each type of classification of bone tumors. There are two different types of primary bone tumors. There are benign and malignant. They are abnormal growths of tissue that generally arise in the body soft tissue. With primary bone tumors, they develop in the bones first rather than elsewhere. Primary bone tumors often occur while the skeleton is still developing. And that's why we see them in children and young adults because their bones are still growing. It may be painful, but it's often symptom-free. The most common types of benign bone tumors are osteochondromas, which mostly affect young people between the ages of 10 and 20. And they most commonly affect the leg, the pelvis, the scapula, or the arm. Then we have osteoblastomas, which affect children and adolescents. It can be painful and debilitating, especially if it's in the spine. And then we have spinal osteoblastomas that if they get to the point of debilitation, it can cause paralysis if not removed because they grow in size. The osteoblastomas, small painful tumors that usually affect adolescents may destabilize and deform the spine. Before I move on, I wanna let you all know that I've listed these examples of the primary benign tumors as examples. I don't expect you to memorize them per se. I just want you to be aware that primary bone tumors usually occur in young adults or children because their bones are growing and it may or may not be painful. So then I'm gonna be moving on to the malignant primary bone tumors. They usually affect older adults. The most common types of malignant bone tumors are the osteosarcomas and the marrow tumors. We've already talked about the primary tumors, so let's talk about secondary bone tumors. Secondary bone tumors arise as a result of soft tissue tumors metastasizing to the bone. Remember that primary bone tumors occur in the bone first. Secondary occur in soft tissue tumors metastasizing to the bone. So they start elsewhere and they metastasize to the bone. Because they start elsewhere and they metastasize to the bone, they are always malignant. They most commonly originate in the breast, the kidney, the lung, the prostate, and the thyroid, and then they metastasize to the bone. Common risk factors and causes of secondary bone tumors is a family history of cancer, exposure to toxins or radiation, obesity, history of cancer, injury, trauma to the bone, or they have no known cause. The treatment of bone tumors. Chemotherapy is usually the first choice for malignant bone tumors. If it is unsuccessful, there is no need to move on to radiation. It can also prevent fractures and may shrink the tumor significantly to avoid surgery. If the tumor can't be shrinked after chemotherapy, then surgery might be required. And in extreme cases, amputation may be necessary to stop the growth. If bones or joints have become weakened, they can be replaced or strengthened with rods or implants. If that doesn't work, radiation, usually administered either before or after the tumor is removed. Or it could be a combination. If the bone tumors are a result of metastasis, the primary soft tissue tumors must also be treated. Now let's talk about nursing interventions. If a patient is not mobile and they're not walking, they would be more prone to thromboembolisms. 
So we have to prevent those if hospitalized and not moving very much. Pain management is usually very significant. If they've gone to surgery or they're doing chemo, then they, a high protein, high calorie diet is especially important. Activity, we need to have rest period to help our body recuperate. The activity level should be based on the type of pain and sig- surgery performed. Pay attention to specific weight bearing limitations because we wouldn't want those rods or implants to be jeopardized because of us not adhering to weight bearing limitations. Safety. Make sure that the patient is safe by using handrails when ambulating down the stairs. Physical therapy and crutch training if the lower extremity is involved or occupational therapy if it's the upper extremities. Make sure that they're prescribed the proper exercises and they're adhered to. Bed safety. Make sure that their bed is in lowest position. Call light within reach. Nausea is a common thing, especially with some medications and chemotherapy. So we must be mindful of providing them with small meals that are high in protein and make sure that they're taking in enough fluid. We need to prepare the patient and the family for possible surgery. So consents and blood loss and all the risks and benefits associated with surgery. We need to talk to them about the possibility of their limb being amputated or salvaged and the associated care, like wound care afterwards. We need to make sure that we elevate the foot of the bed or the affected residual limb on a pillow for the first 24 hours. Promote range of motion exercises to increase strength. VTE prevention, we've already talked about that. We need to treat their pain. We need to make sure that if they're gonna be having chemotherapy that they're not gonna have secondary bone marrow suppression and risk for infection. And then also think about pathological fractures and the tertiary prevention that is associated with that, such as external support, fixation devices, restrictive weight-bearing exercises, and use of assistive devices. Make sure to utilize the other disciplines that help in the prevention of pathological fractures. Here are some resources for bone tumors. One last thing that I wanna tell you about bone tumors, I don't expect you to memorize all the different types of bone tumors. What I want you to mainly focus on is the nursing interventions associated with these bone tumors. You should have a general understanding of the differences between primary and secondary malignant bone tumors. But all in all, focus on how they're classified and the nursing interventions associated with them. Let's move on to gout. So there's a pathophysiology associated with gout. Usually it's because there's uric acid buildup in the blood or body fluids. This uric acid buildup precipitates or accumulates in the connective tissue, forming TOFI. These crystals trigger an immune response and neutrophils come in and they secrete lysosomes to phagocytose or eat away at this precipitative accumulation of crystals formed by the uric acids that have come. Lysosomes damage tissue and exacerbate the immune response. I'm gonna play this video so that you can see what I've just explained in the form of a video. Gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis that causes severe pain and swelling in one or more of your joints. These attacks happen suddenly when there's a buildup of uric acid, a chemical found naturally in your body's tissues. It's also in many foods, such as meat and shellfish. Normally, uric acid passes through your kidneys and leaves your body in urine. But in some people, the kidneys don't function properly and can't get rid of enough uric acid. In other cases, the body produces too much uric acid. Over time, this extra acid can form into tiny, sharp crystals, which collect around your joints. A gout attack strikes when your body's immune system is triggered, often at night. White blood cells engulf the crystals, causing inflammation, pain, and redness. Gout attacks usually happen in a single joint, like your big toe or your knee. Within hours, the pain and swelling can become intense. Pain relievers and anti-inflammatories are usually prescribed to ease pain and reduce swelling. After one to two weeks, the inflammation eventually goes away on its own. If you have gout, talk to your doctor about medications and lifestyle changes that can help. So I hope that video was helpful in helping you to visualize what gout does inside a patient's body. Now there's two different types of gout. There's primary gout and then there's secondary gout. Primary gout 
is due to a decrease in renal excretion of uric acid. Remember, uric acid builds up in the body, which accumulates in connective tissue. If the renal system is not excreting it, then it's gonna build up in the system. Or maybe there is a genetic defect in the way that your body metabolizes purines, leading to high uric acid or hyperuricemia. Hereditary factors might play a role or over secretion of uric acid or a combination of all four. That's primary gout. Secondary gout is associated with drugs like thiazides, diuretics, and cyclosporins. Secondary gout is also associated with other diseases like diabetes mellitus and hypertension. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide. There's risk factors associated with gout. Excessive alcohol intake, especially beer. Radical dieting practices that involve starvation, like the keto diets, where you have to eat a lot of protein, especially red organ meats. Not so much chicken, but the red meats seafood, or diets that have high fructose corn syrup. Gout usually occurs between the ages of 40 and 60 in men and the ages 60 and 80 in women. It is more common in males than in females. I want to mention that gout is usually associated with metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? Well, remember that metabolic syndrome is usually associated with a high waist circumference, high fasting blood triglycerides, high cholesterol levels, elevated blood pressure, an elevated fasting glucose level, or abnormalities noted on three or more of these tests usually indicate metabolic syndrome. And that's where it goes back into secondary gout associated with these diseases like diabetes mellitus and hypertension, which is associated with metabolic syndrome. So it's not unusual where a patient is going to have gout and also have hypertension and diabetes mellitus because we often see these complications associated with those diseases. Other complications could be renal calculi. Remember, the uric acid is excreted through the kidneys. Arthrosclerotic diseases, cardiovascular lesions, arthritis caused by inflammation of the joint, nephropathy, increased susceptibility to infections. All these are complications of gout. What are assessment findings of gout? The joints are going to be tender, swollen, dusky red, or purple joint. Commonly the first metatarsophalangeal joint in the initial joint manifestation. Remember, it's the immune system attacking that crystal formation of the uric acid. Due to the inflammation, they're going to have limited movement of the joint. They're going to have tophi formation or tophi formation. There's going to be a slide that I'm going to show you about what tophi look like. There's going to be tophi over the skin that may ulcerate and release chalky white exudate or pus, and it's the body's way of trying to release the uric acid buildup in the body. There's going to be secondary joint degeneration because that erosion takes place. Deformity and disability might be accompanied, and warmth because of the inflammatory process, as well as tenderness. Here's a picture that I was talking to you about. In advanced gout, that tophi formation is going to be in the fingers and in the ears. What diagnostic laboratory results are we going to see? Because uric acid level is high, it's going to be elevated, especially during an acute gout attack. White blood cells and differentials are going to be elevated. Serum lipid levels, remember, it's associated with metabolic syndrome, so that's going to be high. Uric acid levels is going to be greater as well and may be chronically elevated in 20% of the patients. What about imaging? Under x-ray, the articular cartilage and the subchondral bone shows punched out areas of erosion or lysis, and we'll look at that a little bit later on. Ultrasonography is gonna reveal a double contour sign with lines overlaying the surface of the joint cartilage, especially with recurrent attacks. Here you see the punched out areas of erosion or lysis, and in this one you see haziness, as noted in late gout. What are our nursing interventions? Because the patient's going to be in pain and their joint's going to be swollen, rest periods, so cluster activities, and then coordinate rest periods in between. Make sure they're in a diet low in purines. If they're immobile, implement VTE prophylaxis. You want to paddle and cradle the affected joints. We want to assist with activities of daily living. We want to assist with ADLs, but also promote their independence as much as possible. Meds play a big role in pain relief and making sure that the inflammatory process goes down. And we'll talk about these gout medications a little bit later on. We want to use cold compresses in the inflamed area. We want to make sure that we obtain specimens to make sure that we monitor the uric acid levels as well as other diagnostic lab results that we're going to need to confirm diagnosis of gout and manage it.
Let's talk about osteomalacia. Osteomalacia is a defect in the bone building process that causes softening of the bones. What are the causes of this defect in bone building process? Inadequate concentration of vitamin D. Either the body is unable to break it down or to adequately utilize the vitamin D that we absorb. Inadequate concentration of calcium or phosphorus or ineffective mineralization and coordination of vitamin D, calcium, and phosphorus. The prognosis is usually good with treatment. I'm going to go ahead and play you a video that talks about osteomalacia and what... In today's video, we're going to be talking about osteomalacia. Now, this is known as a defect in the mineralization of bone. And in fact, the actual translation of it means soft bone. The cause of osteomalacia is due to either vitamin D deficiency, phosphate deficiency, or an inherited deficiency in alkaline phosphatase. When we're talking about the pathogenesis of osteomalacia, I want you to have a look at this diagram here. So humans produce vitamin D from sunlight, and this vitamin D is processed in the liver. From here, it's turned into calcidiol. And what calcidiol does is it decreases the excretion of calcium from the kidneys, and it increases calcitriol formation. Now, calcitriol acts in the small intestines and promotes the increased absorption of calcium. So if we have less vitamin D, then that means we have less calcitriol formation and calcidiol formation. Now, since bone is constantly being rebuilt and broken down, having less calcium available means the new bone that will form will be less mineralized. And this is where we have osteomalacia. The symptoms of osteomalacia include bone pain, muscle weakness, a waddling gait, which looks like this, easy fracturing, pelvic flattening, and bending of bone. The diagnosis of osteomalacia is usually done by an x-ray examination, and if there's appearance of something that looks like rickets or pseudofractures, it's usually the diagnosis is osteomalacia. However, we can do other things like bone scans and a bone biopsy. The treatment of osteomalacia involves vitamin D supplementation. So this can be around 10,000 international units of vitamin D per week. Phosphate supplementation can also be given and calcitriol supplementation in cases of renal disease where calcitriol is not forming. I hope that video was helpful in helping explain what happens in osteomalacia. Does this figure look similar to what he was talking about? I'm a big believer in understanding the pathophysiology of a disease process. If you understand the pathophysiology, you'll be able to better understand the causes, the risk factors, and the complications, as well as the assessment findings that you will see with osteomalacia. You must understand that vitamin D regulates the absorption of calcium ions from the intestine. So we start here. We get vitamin D from sunlight. This vitamin D goes to the liver and is converted to calcidiol. When calcidiol acts on the kidney, it then increases calcitriol formation. Calcitriol acts on the bone as well as the small intestine who increase the absorption of the dietary calcium that we eat in our diet. Calcitriol not only acts on the small in intestine, but it also works on the bone. And what it does is it tells the bone to break down, therefore releasing the calcium and the phosphorus into the bloodstream. The release of calcium from the bone and the increased absorption of calcium in the small intestine increases serum calcium or the calcium found in the blood. The other way that our body increases serum calcium is through the parathyroid gland. It senses low serum calcium, so low calcium in our blood, and increases PTH secretion. Remember, PTH works on the kidneys to then produce calcitriol which then produces calcitriol, which have a very similar effect to breaking down the bone and working on the kidney to then convert to calcitriol and increasing the absorption of dietary calcium. 
This is the process that your body takes in order to increase serum calcium levels. If we have less vitamin D, then the, the chain reaction from the liver converting it to calcidiol, then triggering the kidney to produce calcitriol, and then affecting the bone and the small intestine to increase cal serum calcium can't take place. And the parathyroid gland is working overtime in order to bypass decreased vitamin D and the liver conversion of calcidiol. Because the bone is constantly being built or broken down in relation to an increase or decrease in serum calcium, having less calcium available or vitamin D or any part of the mineralization part of the bone leads to osteomalacia. Remember, the cause of osteomalacia is inadequate concentration of vitamin D, which starts the entire process that we were just talking about, low calcium, low phosphorus, or ineffective mineralization. An inadequate concentration of any of these causes a defect in the bone building process that causes softening of the bone. This is a picture of vitamin D deficiency osteomalacia. Picture A is before treatment, and picture B is the treatment with vitamin D. Picture A looks porous, weak. Picture B looks more solid and formed. One thing that I wanna to talk to you about PTH, remember, when vitamin D is lacking, falling serum calcium levels or low calcium in the blood stimulate synthesis and secretion of the parathyroid hormone, this one right here. This secretion causes the release of calcium from the bone, decreasing renal calcium excretion and increasing renal phosphate excretion. Remember, calcium and phosphate have an inverse relationship. When the concentration of phosphate in the bone decreases, osteoids may be produced but mineralization can't proceed normally. Remember, causes are inadequate phosphorus. So a low amount of phosphorus means that osteoids are produced, but mineralization can't proceed normally. Large quantities of osteoid accumulate, and they don't mineralize, meaning the structure lacks density. Look back at the picture. This is more dense, this is less dense. The result is gross deformity of spongy and compact bone. Question, what is the difference between osteoporosis and osteomalacia? Your answer is right here. Osteoporosis refers to the degeneration of already constructed bone, making them brittle, while osteomalacia is an abnormality in the building process of the bone, making them soft. You don't have the building blocks to help the bone become formed and mineralized. What are the causes? And I encourage you to go back to the pathoflow sheet, this one right here. If there's a liver issue, if there's a kidney issue, if there's a small intestine issue, none of this chain reaction will happen. So if none of the chain reactions will happen, then conditions that reduce the absorption of fat soluble vitamin D, hepatic or renal disease, low phosphorus. Remember, hypophosphatemia means low phosphorus in the blood, which means high calcium in the blood or high serum calcium. Think about this. If the calcium is in the blood, that means that it's not in the bone, which means there's a lack of the building block of the bone, which means that the bone does not have its building blocks to form dense mineralized bone. Inhibition of mineralization, inadequate dietary intake of vitamin D or inadequate exposure to sunlight that then starts the whole chain reaction. If you have kidney disease, such as tubular reabsorption of phosphate, malabsorption of vitamin D, a malfunctioning parathyroid gland, which secretes the PTH hormone, contributes to calcium deficiency, which interferes with vitamin D activation of the kidney and prohibits that chain reaction. Prolonged use of anti-seizure medication also blocks this chain reaction. Another thing to note, osteomalacia is the adult form of rickets. The whole chain reaction of building good strong bones when you're young starts with good vitamin D absorption. This is known as rickets 
in children, but in adults, it can happen too. And it is called osteomalacia. Because we've talked about the pathophysiology, I hope that by now the risk factors are gonna become easy. Anything that prohibits vitamin D absorption, it's going to inhibit the chain reaction that should happen for absorption of vitamin D. Anybody that is housebound, stays indoors a lot, or is hospitalized, malnourished, sun deprived, has had gastro bypass, or uses very strong sunblock, or deals with obesity issues, is going to have a risk factor for osteomalacia. Usually patients with osteomalacia have a history of poor diet, leg or lower back pain, which may worsen at night, bone pain, weight loss, anorexia, or bone tenderness. Remember, the bone is not being able to be built up because of the lack of the building blocks. The incidences, it can affect all ages. And in adults, it usually affects older age groups. It equally affects both men and women, and it typically occurs in overcrowded urban areas where smog limits sunlight penetration. What are the complications? If we don't have compact, dense bones, we might have spontaneous multiple fractures, bone deformities, osteomyelitis. What are we going to see when we assess our patients? They might have bowed legs, knock knees, rachitic rosary, or beating on the ends of the ribs, enlarged wrists and ankles, pigeon breast, or protruding ribs and the sternum, a bulging forehead, frontal bosing, muscle weakness, because they might have low calcium, difficulty walking or a waddling gait, muscle spasms, fractures, or a positive Chovastec sign, or kyphoscoliosis. And it may be due to the fact that the body is trying to bring back the calcium back into the bone and it leaves the calcium, the serum calcium level low in the blood, causing Chovastec or Trousseau sign. If you don't remember what those signs are, I encourage you to look it up. But the muscle spasms, Chovastex, Trousseau signs are caused by hypocalcemia. What diagnostic test results can we see in the lab? Serum calcium concentration is low or near normal based off of the body's ability to compensate for low calcium or vitamin D. Serum calcidiol levels are low. Parathyroid hormones are elevated because it's trying to trigger that activation system to increase serum calcium. Calcitriol levels may be normal or elevated. Serum inorganic phosphorate concentrations are decreased. Alkaline phosphatase level is increased. Alkaline phosphatase level is increased. Alkaline, al alkaline phosphatase level is a chemical, is our, alkaline phosphatase is one kind of enzyme found in your body. These enzymes are proteins that help chemical reactions happen. You have alkaline phosphatase throughout your body, including your liver, your digestive system, and your kidneys, and bones. If your ALP or alkaline phosphatase level is high, there might be other tests that the doctor might do, but just know that it's usually associated with liver problems or the bones, and it's just one laboratory result in the scheme of other laboratory results and imaging results that this helps confirm a diagnosis of osteomalacia. Urine calcium levels are decreased. Remember, if the body is trying to increase calcium in your body, it's not going to be excreting it in your urine. What about imaging? We can use x-ray and the x-ray is gonna show thinning of the bone, bone softening later on in life. There's gonna be abnormalities, stress fractures and pathological fractures might indicate that there's no ossification, which confirms the diagnosis. Dual energy x-ray scans reveal that bone density is low. What is the medical treatment of osteomalacia? Generally, we wanna treat any bone deformities or fractures that have occurred as a result of osteomalacia. We wanna make sure that we increase ultraviolet light exposure, and more importantly, we wanna reverse the underlying disease process, whatever that might be. We wanna diet high in vitamin D, high calcium. Medications, we can use vitamin D supplementation, IV calcium salts if tetany develops, or phosphorus supplementation, anything that will help increase the ingredients to build good strong bones. Surgery might be necessary for intestinal diseases to correct small intestinal absorption issues and then also make sure appropriate repair of bone fractures that may have occurred get taken care of. What are our nursing interventions? Make sure that the patients are educated 
on foods that are high in vitamin D. We educate them about increasing their exposure to sunlight. If they have liver or kidney disease, we might have to administer the activated form of vitamin D in the form of calcitriol. We could get a consult for the dietitian to come and help them plan their meals and improve their food choices. We want to increase their weight-bearing exercises and their activity as tolerated. Provide them emotional support, make sure that they're safe from injury, provide appropriate fracture care if they've already sustained a fracture, obtain lab, serum, and urine calcium levels as indicated, assess for signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. We want to make sure that we're monitoring the serum and urine calcium levels on a regular basis, assess for signs and symptoms of vitamin D toxicity, especially if they're getting vitamin D, and with long-term use of vitamin D, renal calculi might be an issue. We want them to increase their physical activity as much as possible in a safe manner, and we want them to take care of their fractures. Let's move on to Paget's disease. Paget's disease is a disorder of localized rapid bone turnover, and it mostly affects the skull, the femur, the tibia, the pelvic bone, and the vertebra. It usually occurs in those individuals greater than 50. It's greater in men than in women, and especially with those that have a family history. Brothers and sisters usually develop the disease. We don't really know what causes it, but we believe that it might be a slow or dormant viral infection, maybe mumps, and it usually tends to appear in the Northern European descent. The pathophysiology of Paget's disease comes down to three destructive phases or processes. Phase one is osteolytic or the breaking down of bone. Remember osteoclasts destroy bone through a process called osteolysis? Because the bone is now broken down, the body attempts to rebuild it. But when it tries to rebuild it through osteoblasts, it is poorly done. Osteoclasts are constantly breaking down the bone, while osteoblasts are constantly trying to build it back up. So the remodeling process is poorly done. The third phase, which happens later on, is osteosclerotic. Over time, this breaking down and this poor remodeling of phase one and two causes irregular bone disposition. And in that, new bone is weaker, irregular, and allows for more fibrous connective tissue rather than dense mineralized tissue. Because bone needs to be constantly remodeled, blood vessels infiltrate and cause the bone to become hypervascular or this mosaic pattern, as you see in this picture right here. This is what it looks like under the microscope and this is a picture of a mosaic pattern. So it's highly vascularized because anything that requires high growth requires a lot of vascularization. What are we going to see? The areas that are usually affected are the skull, which usually thickens. And what are we going to see when we assess the patient? The hat no longer fits. The cranium enlarges, but the face does not. On assessment, the face is going to look small and triangular. They're gonna have facial drooping and the jawline might increase in size, but the teeth don't because the jawbone that the teeth are inserted to don't have very much to grab onto. And so their teeth change. The femur and the tibia bow with foot drop. And they have a waddling gait. They get fractures. They have osteoarthritis, warmth and tenderness. Because their cranium enlarges, their cranial nerve might get pinched. If any of their cranial nerves get pinched, they might have hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, deafness. Their spine gets bent forward and becomes rigid. Then their chin rests on their chest because it's gotten rigid and enlarged. They have a short trunk appearance and their arms are bent forward and outward. And they have this kyphosis going on in the thoracic area. Their thoracic area becomes rigid, which then puts a lot more stress on the heart. Remember, Bone that is constantly being broken down and built up again needs a lot of blood supply. So this puts a lot of stress on the heart. So they might have left ventricular hypertrophy and aortic stenosis because of the large demand on the heart to produce more blood supply to help the bone rebuild. If their thoracic spine becomes kyphotic, their spine is bent forward and their thorax rigid, what is that going to do to their respirations? They're gonna have a barrel chest, so their chest is going to get enlarged. Their trunk is gonna get flexed on the legs to maintain balance. And they're usually prone to balance issues because now they're off balance. They might have left ventricular hypertrophy, which means that 
Now, because the body is producing this hypervascular vessels to maintain the rapid bone turnover to help build up the bone that's being broken down, the body is trying to work overtime to perfuse these new vascular areas of the bone, which might lead to left ventricular hypertrophy or aortic stenosis. Here's a picture of a classic clinical manifestation of a person with Paget's disease. What are the symptoms? Most don't feel symptoms, but some do. Because of the bone vascularity, they might have tenderness or warmth or high output cardiac failure because of the increased metabolic demands. They might have pain, which is moderate, deep, and aching because of the bone malformation and maybe the increase with weight bearing. Patients may wrongly say that it's due to age or arthritis. What are the complications? If the bone is constantly being broken down and remodeled poorly, after a while, pathological fractures. Just simple stressing of the bone might cause their bone to break. Their head is enlarged, blindness and hearing loss might come through the pinching of the cranial nerves. Osteoarthritis, because of the breaking down and the building of the bone, they might get bone tumors or sarcomas. It can lead to hypertension, loosening of the teeth, renal calculi, because now their body is trying to reabsorb the calcium to help rebuild the bone faster. They, have, they may have hypercalcemia. With the breaking down of the bone, it releases the calcium into the blood supply, causing hypercalcemia. It just depends on what phase the Paget's disease is in, the breaking down or the building up. They might have gout attacks, heart disease or failure due to the increased demand on the heart for blood supply to the bone. Carpal and tarsal tunnel syndrome or spinal stenosis might occur because the bone is being remodeled poorly and pinches on the nerves on the hands or the spinal cord. They might have increased to stroke. Vascular steel syndrome. I thought this was very interesting. We used to think that Paget's disease was causing weakness in the lower extremities or paraplegia due to the cord being compressed because the bone is being enlarged. But now we know that it's due to blood flow diversion in the bone, not because of the pinching or the compression of the spinal nerves. What labs help us diagnose Paget's disease? Serum calcium and phosphate levels are usually normal. Serum osteocalcin level is usually increased. Osteocalcin is released into the circulation from the matrix during bone resorption. Therefore, it is considered a marker of bone turnover rather than a specific marker of bone formation. Alkaline phosphatase level, this is the same laboratory that we were talking about in osteomalacia, is the most useful lab result for diagnosing metabolic bone diseases. It helps you to detect and identify skeletal diseases characterized primarily by marked osteoblastic activity. Osteoblastic activity deals with the building of the bone. These two, pyridinolin, collagen, and urine hydroxyproline levels are elevated, usually are seen when there is bone degradation or collagen catabolism, which is part of phase one of Paget's disease where the bone is being broken down and excreted in the urine. Uric acid levels may be increased, which is more commonly seen in men. The x-rays are going to show bone expansion and increased bone density. Bone scans are going to show early pagetic lesions. CT scans and MRIs are going to show extra bony extensions and maybe bone tumors. You can see that here's a normal bone and here are the pagets. The sclerotic area right here where it's kind of protruding and larger than the rest of the bone. And we see a lytic area where it's being broken down. We see the bone tumor right here on an MRI. What are some common medical treatments? We give the patient medication. We give them calcitonin, subcutaneous calcitonin salmon, which is usually primarily for patients who are unable to tolerate biphosphates. We do this so that we can tone down the serum calcitonin. The best way that I remember calcitonin is that it tones down serum calcium. It brings back the calcium from the blood in back into the bone, which help the remodeling process. For pain relief, we give them NSAIDs, biphosphates such as Fosamax or Actinel or Reclast. 
are medicines that slow down or prevent bone loss and they help strengthen the bone. Biphosphates inhibit osteoclasts or the breaking down and reabsorbing minerals such as calcium from the bone. Other medical treatments include joint replacement, osteotomy for extreme deformity. So an osteotomy is the cutting and the reshaping of the bone in order to relieve pressure. We can do a decompression procedure for acute neurological deficits and we want to reduce pathological fractures that occur. What are some nursing interventions? We want to make sure that we turn them and we change their positions frequently. We want to make sure that we prevent injury due to pressure, assist them with activities of daily living, administer medications such as calcitonin and biphosphates, provide emotional support if they're immobile for long periods of time, VTE prophylaxis, prevent falls or fractures. If they have hearing loss or visual changes, then we want to speak slowly to them and make sure that they're safe when they walk or move around. We want to make sure that their diet is adequate and calcium containing foods. Make sure that if they have foot drop to wear high topped sneakers or to use a footboard. We want to monitor lab results, especially those lab results that monitor the breakdown of bone, appropriate surgical interventions. Here are some resources for those affected by pagets, gouts, or osteomalacia. Let's move on to ALP, serum alkaline phosphatase. Serum alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme that influences bone calcification. It's also associated with liver, but it helps rule in or rule out liver or bone complications. It's most useful in diagnosing metabolic diseases. It is usually helpful in detecting and identifying skeletal diseases that are characterized primarily by marked osteoblastic activity. So when it's elevated, we know that the bone is trying to rebuild itself. We use this as a marker to assess if the patient is responding appropriately to vitamin D treatment as it relates to osteomalacia, rickets, and to rule out Paget's disease. We wanna make sure that the patient is fasting for at least eight hours. Remember, it is usually associated with the liver or bone function. For the procedure, we wanna collect the blood in a four milliliter clot activator tube. We wanna send the sample to the lab immediately. Post-procedure, we wanna tell the patient that they can resume their usual diet. Normal levels for males and females are right there. Significant results, skeletal diseases such as Paget's disease or problems with the liver, Bone metastasis might cause serum alkaline phosphatase because the bone tumors are growing rapidly or hyperparathyroidism. Moderate elevation is seen in osteomalacia or deficiency induced rickets. Another lab sample that we might have to draw is serum calcium. And this is to help guide us in helping patients with renal failure, renal transplant, endocrine disorders, malignancies, cardiac disease, or skeletal disorders. When we obtain a serum calcium, we want to try to perform the venue puncture without using a tourniquet as much as possible. We want to collect the blood sample in a 3 or 4 milliliter clot activator tube. Why do we want to not use a tourniquet? Because it will falsely increase serum calcium levels due to venous stasis. The normal results are right here. One thing that I want to mention is I list the normal levels of lab results here. But on the exam, I'll rarely ask you a question that deals specifically with a lab value number, a lab value. I won't ask you for lab values. I'll say if it's increased or decreased. And then from there, I'll ask you the question. Here are some reasons why the serum calcium might be high. And then the clinical manifestations associated with high serum calcium level. Here are the reasons for low calcium levels and the clinical manifestations associated with low serum calcium levels. Another lab value that we need to familiarize ourselves with is serum uric acid level. The purpose is to mainly identify gout or to help detect renal dysfunction because uric acid level is excreted through the kidneys. Here is the normal result. Some things to take into consideration when obtaining a serum uric acid level is that loop diuretics, thiazides, 
and low doses of aspirin may increase uric acid levels. Aspirin in high doses may cause decreased levels. Abnormal results may be caused by these disease processes and then low serum uric acids may be caused due to these disease processes. Let's move on to medications. Calcitonin, usually indicated for treatment of Paget's disease. It helps decrease the breaking down of bone through osteoclastic activity. It decreases mineral release and collagen breakdown in the bone. And it also increases the urinary excretion of calcium and phosphorus. We can administer it the intramuscular route, the nasal route, or subcutaneous. And here are the side effects. If you guys are familiar with low calcium level signs and symptoms, then these side effects are going to be easy for you to remember. Vitamin D, calciferol or calcitriol. The uses are to regulate minerals such as calcium and phosphorus found in the body, especially the bone. And we know that we get our, our sources from sun exposure and we can also get them orally or through an intramuscular injection. Please review the side effects, especially those that are indicative of vitamin D toxicity. Colchicine. Colchicine is an anti-gout medication that it helps reduce lactic acid and decrease inflammation. The side effects are listed here. Incompatibilities and interactions are listed there. Our nursing implications are that we would help prevent gout. And one thing to note is that colchicine must be given with allopurinol or probenicid to decrease serum uric acid levels. However, colchicine should be started before the other agent because a sudden change in uric acid level may cause a gout attack. Probenicid, also, it helps block renal tubular reabsorption of uric acid, increasing the excretion of uric acid. Please be familiar with the side effects and incompatibilities or interactions. Some nursing implications, you want to tell the patient to drink lots of fluid because it's going to help excrete the uric acid through the kidneys. Don't use probenicid to treat gout until an acute attack subsides. It has no analgesic or anti-inflammatory effects, which is why we use NSAIDs for pain. We want to monitor the BUN and renal function tests results periodically in long-term therapy. Allopurinol, also an anti-gout drug. Here are the side effects and incompatibilities or interactions. The nursing implications are that rash may develop. Monitor uric acid levels to evaluate drugs effectiveness. Monitor the daily urine output, which is, should be at least two liters. And monitor the CBC and hepatic and renal function. Indomethacin is an NSAID used for arthritis or gout to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, to produce an anti-inflammatory analgesic and antipyretic effect. Here are the side effects and incompatibilities or interactions. Please familiarize yourself with those. The nursing implications is that you want to monitor for heart attack, stroke, GI bleed. Take the food with food or milk because it can cause GI upset. Prednisone or corticosteroids are used for severe inflama inflammation or immunosuppressions. Please be familiar with the side effects and the incompatibilities or interactions. The nursing implications are that we need to monitor for Cushing syndrome, osteoporosis, with, especially with long-term use. We want to make sure that we educate the patient not to stop the medication abruptly, and it could cause them to be susceptible to infection. That's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much for listening, and take care.